We spend a lot of time reflecting on the darkness of Good Friday and Jesus' death on the cross. Yet the hope Jesus gives does not end with the cross. The cross is just the beginning. Through his resurrection, Christ initiated the rebirth of all creation. In the days following the resurrection of Jesus, everything changed for his followers. Their hearts were stirred with new hope. It was as if the new life of Jesus had also given new life to them. God had fulfilled his promise to his people. Though they had been long in the desert, they now experienced the abundant life of their risen King. We too have the hope of resurrection. Christ has not left us to ourselves, but has given us the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us, to sustain us until Christ's coming. From death, from decay, from the desert, we have been called to life. Well, happy Mother's Day. I know it's different than it's been ever. Nobody is going to the restaurants and we're having to find unique ways to tell our mothers and our wives that we love them, and, but I'm sure you'll figure that out. Um, I appreciated Brad's announcement. I, I'll tell you, um, I love good writing <laughs> in the sentence that says, we are completely uninterested in participating in this debate. That's one of the best sentences ever <laughs> as it relates to face masks. That was, that was brilliant. Um, uh, I, I touched base with a number of local pastors this week, and several sent me some videos just greeting you. And they were uh, uh, different formats, and I just wasn't able to combine all of them. Uh, I'll do something for our staff with them, but uh, one in particular, uh, I'll let one pastor represent all the area pastors in bringing greetings. We are part of something much bigger than Lima Community Church. We're part of the body of Christ in Lima, Ohio. Watch this. Greetings, Lima Community Church. This is Dr. Dennis Ward of Second Baptist Church, and I want to encourage everybody at Lima Community and all the area churches Remember that God is still on the throne and that the joy of the Lord is our strength and the strength of the Lord is our joy. So be encouraged. God be with you. My good friend, Dr. Ward. Well, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien uh, grew up in rural England. In fact, uh, he said later in life that much of uh, what he wrote about Middle Earth and hobbits was modeled after uh, the rural life he lived. His, his aunt's farm was called Bag's End. There was a little town called um, Hobbiton in, uh, in Warwickshire. Um, it had a river by it, and uh, he spent four years uh, in that little town. Tolkien had great respect for the people of that region of England, and he modeled the hobbits after them. Uh, he said of them that they had small imaginations, <laughs> which sounds like it's, it's criticism, but then he says, but great courage. In fact, let's, let's look at what he wrote. The hobbits are just, um, uh, the, the hobbits are rustic people made small in size because it reflects the generally small reach of their imagination, not the small reach of their courage or latent power. I've always been impressed that we are here surviving because of the indomitable courage of quite small people against impossible odds. Now, as a lover of sentences, I love that one, too. The indomitable courage of quite small people <laughs> against impossible odds. There's something about Tolkien's work, The, the Lord of the Rings, that captures us, that, that just grips us. And I think it's because each of us longs to be on a great adventure. Each of us longs to give our lives for something 
so much greater than ourselves. Each of us want to be part of something that's worthy of all of our strength. My favorite character in all of the Lord of the Rings is Samwise Genji. He's a simple little hobbit. He's loyal to the nth degree. He will not quit. He's courageous without knowing that he is so. Frodo said to him, go back, Sam. I'm going to Mordor alone. <laughs> Sam says, of course you are, and I'm coming with you. And he did. Tolkien wrote of uh, Sam, one tiny hobbit against all the evil the world could muster. A sane being would have given up, but Samwise burned with a magnificent madness, a glowing obsession to surmount every obstacle, to find Frodo, destroy the ring, and cleanse Middle Earth of its festering malignancy. He knew he would try again, fail perhaps, and try once more a thousand times if need be, but he would never give up in the quest. Sam Wise said, come on, Frodo, I can't carry the ring for you, but I can carry you. So get up. Come on, Mr. Frodo. Sam will give you a ride. Just tell him where you want to go, and we'll go. Frodo said to him, tired and weak and sick, he said, I'm glad to be with you, Sam Wise, here at the end of all things. You know, the church... Uh, has been through pandemics before. I didn't know much about this, but being in the middle of one, I decided to study them and, uh, and found that uh, several times in our 2,000 year history, the church has, has gone through and they've been costly. Um, in the third century, a plague shook the church. Cyprian of Carthage was the bishop and he wrote this, we are learning not to fear death. Heedless of the danger, these followers of Christ took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy. Uh, in uh, 1527, there was a, a recurrence of the bubonic plague that had struck two centuries earlier. And it happened to return in the German city of uh, Wittenberg. Uh, and it killed about 30% of the inhabitants. And the students and the faculty of Wittenberg University were told to leave the city. And they begged the most famous professor at the university to leave, but he would not. Martin Luther was that professor, and his wife, Katerina, was pregnant at the time. And they remained in their beloved city in order to treat those who were infected. And despite the calls for him to leave with his family, Luther's mind was set to help the infected. He writes, Yes, no one should dare leave his neighbor unless there are others who will still care for the sick in their stead and nurse them. In such cases, we must all respect the words of Christ when he said, I was sick and you visited me, Matthew 25. According to this pastor, passage, we are bound to each other in such a way that we may not forsake one another in distress but are obliged to assist and help if they can be helped. It was during this time that he wrote a very interesting sentence. This is just a little brief sentence out of a long article, but he said, we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget it every day. This was a dark time for Martin Luther. His wife gave birth to a little girl named Elizabeth who barely escaped the plague but died eight months later. The Christians who were holding to Lutheran doctrine now were being martyred or sent out into exile with 
no provision. They were constantly in the presence of uncertainty and death and persecution and pain. And it was during this time that Martin Luther wrote uh, his greatest hymn. He, he wrote about 40, but none have uh, the popularity of a mighty fortress is our God. This hymn became an anthem to German Protestants. Protestants. And it's no wonder why, because of their political and social and spiritual instability around them on every front. It was sung by these poor Protestants on their way into exile. And it was sung by martyrs on their way to their deaths. It became a true national hymn of Protestant Germany. I just want to go through it just very quickly, then we're going to get to some scripture. It says, a mighty fortress is our God. And this was a time when castles were built, of course. And, uh, and so he's, he's using uh, Psalms 46 as a, as, as a background. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark, never failing bulwark, is a very strong wall, a defensive wall in a castle. Our helper, he, amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. And the mortal ills he's talking about are more than just sickness, but hard times of every kind. He says, God is our helper in these times. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. The ancient foe, of course, is Satan, the devil. And he's trying hard to work woe, to, to steal and to kill and destroy. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. We are no match for him, but he is no match for our Lord. He goes on to the second verse, and we'll just take two verses here. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? If we tried to stand against the devil in our own strength, we would lose. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. God has chosen a man. Doth ask who that may be, Christ Jesus? It is he. <laughs> it is Jesus. God is perfect man. Man and God, the second Adam who is on our side. Lord Sabaoth, his name. That, uh, uh, Sabaoth means host. He, he is the Lord of hosts. And he's talking about armies. He is the, the host of the angel armies of all of the warriors of heaven. From age to age, the same Jesus. Same yesterday, today, and forever. And he must win the battle. Uh, and uh, that he must win doesn't mean, and if he wins, he's saying he will win. Uh, because there's no other possible outcome in this war. It's a foregone conclusion. He will win the battle. Uh, Justin uh, read uh, John 14. We, we want to revisit it and, uh, and look at uh, just a couple things that uh, Jesus has to say to us here. As I get my notes in order here, somehow they got out of order. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Now, it just uh, stop here a moment. You know, many of us grew up in the King James English where it says, in my father's house are many mansions. And I don't know if this is true. I, I do know that the Greek, <laughs> there's nothing in the Greek that indicates a mansion. Some have said that when they were translating the King James Version and read it to King James, he says, I don't want a room, I want a mansion. And so they put mansion in. Yeah. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, 
We don't know. We don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, um, these words uh, mean something to us. They, they meant more uh, to the original hearers. When he says, I am the way. All throughout the Old Testament, uh, the way is, is featured. This is the way, walk in it, it says in Isaiah 30. Teach me your way, O Lord, Psalm 27. Instead of giving directions, Jesus doesn't say, okay, well, go here, then go there, then go there. He says, come with me. I will take you there. I am the way. He said, I am the truth. Uh, many people have spoken of truth, but few people have embodied it. And this is more important with moral truth than anything else. You, you wouldn't want an adulterer to teach on the, the, uh, the necessity of purity. You, you wouldn't want someone who is hoarding to teach on the value of generosity or a domineering person to, to teach on the beauty of humility. Truth must be conveyed by example. Only Jesus could say, I am the truth. And then he says, I am the life. The psalmist said in Psalm 16, you show me the path of life. Jesus says, I am life. Latch on to me. Know me. And you will live now. And you will live forever. And so uh, our, our predecessors who went through horrific times understood this. They understood that their life was in Jesus. And so they risked without thinking about it because they knew that Jesus was their life and that they were living for more than just today. You know, there is um, uh, a passage in the Old Testament that one morning this week, as I slept, when I woke up, I, I had this beautiful time with the Lord. And this doesn't happen as much as I want it to, and that's probably on me. But it's as if this passage, passage just breathed into me. And it's, it's taken out of Exodus. It's when God says to Moses, tell the people this. This is before any of the plagues. This is God saying, this is what I'm going to do. He says, therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And I will take you as my own people. And I will be your God. He said, I will bring you out. It could be that you're coming out of this time and you and the Lord have, have done some business. And he's saying to you, I'm going to bring you out of whatever it was you laid before me and you confessed before me during this time. I will free you. You don't have to be the same. You don't have to go through the same things. He said, I will redeem you, which um, 
which is speaking of uh, paying the price to, to, to free a slave. I have bought you. I have redeemed you. And I will take you as my own. <laughs> what a promise, right? He says, I will take you as my own. You are mine. These promises are as real today as when they were spoken. They're as real today as Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You and I have a marvelous heritage. We are loved by the sovereign creator, ruler of the universe. I will bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you. And I will take you as my own. To which we say, have at us, Lord. Have at us, Lord. Have at us. We are yours. We are your people. You have brought us through uh, this, this trying time. And that's not to say that the trial's over. I, I know we've got some rough days ahead. I, I know. But we have seen you move. And we thank you. We thank you that you have freed us. That you have redeemed us. And that you have taken us as your own. And we thank you that you are showing us the way. We thank you that you are revealing to us truth. And we thank you that in you we have life, both now and forever. Bless these dear ones who are watching now. I pray that this week they would know your joy 